uh, a very warm welcome to the uh, Thrings Agricultural Seminar. Um, traditionally, this has always been held at Sirencester at the uh, Agriculture University. Uh, unfortunately, for obvious reasons, we couldn't we couldn't be there. I mean, obviously, there are some physical events going on, but we just took the sort of prudent view that we'd repeat last year's webinar. Um, so it's it's great to see so many people with us. I mean, one of the advantages we would have had if, you, if we had been in Sirencester would you would have been able to see all the changes uh, or the sort of the expanded team that we've got. Um, and actually two of our latest, uh, two of our speakers uh, were actually recruited this year. So uh, you can see that we haven't sort of um, let, let a pandemic slow us down in our, in our quest to expand um, our services to our clients. So the format of today, uh, we're going to have four speakers, uh, three from Thrings, and, a, and a, a, we're very excited to have an external speaker as well from the NFU. Um, they'll speak for about 10 minutes each. And then um, what we'll do, if we have enough time, we will have some questions and answers. So if you want to use the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of the screen, uh, by means put the questions in as and when you think of them, and we'll try and get to them later. If we can't actually um, get to them or we just run out of time, then we will pick up those questions with you after the event. Um, and similarly, if you have to leave, this um, webinar is being recorded, so you will be able to watch it uh, on our YouTube channel at a later, a later time. So I'll quickly just go through the, um, through, through the speakers so that we have to do that during the, uh, during the webinar itself. Um, so our, um, our first speaker will be Stuart Roberts. Uh, who many of you know was deputy president of the NFU. So absolutely delighted to have to have Stuart talking um, talking today. Uh, I know he's just got back from COP, so uh, you know I'm sure he's going to have a lot a lot of things to say about that. Stuart himself obviously is a farmer, uh, but he's been involved in lots of other uh, lo lo lots of other industry connections along the way. He's been on the board of Red Tractor and um, also HDB, uh, as well as being involved in the uh, in the uh, the meat supply chain so you know we're really, really excited to have to have him here then we've got Jonathan Thompson Jonathan's one of our new recruits uh, he joined us back in January from a London firm and he's based down in Romsey uh, he's got a particular interest and fascination with the uh, Agriculture Act um, and the and the recently um, uh, enacted uh, Environment Act so he's going to talk about that in the context of natural capital and um, and sort of carbon uh, mitigation schemes, that sort of thing. Then we've got another newcomer, Diana Miller. She sits in our planning and environmental team. Uh, she was formerly with Wiltshire Council, uh, so she's effectively a, um, a, a gamekeeper turned poacher, um, and we've had success with that in the past, So um, and so she's very welcome. And then finally, our speaker, our final speaker will be Mark Charter. Uh, who heads up the Romsey team uh, and is spearheading our sort of expansion along the south coast uh, and the southeast, and he's going to talk about development law. So I think we ought to uh, we ought to crack on with the talks. And so, as I said, it's a it's a very warm welcome to and to Stuart, uh, who's going to talk about uh, COP and uh, well COP and the, and farming with an uncertain future. So um, over to you, Stuart. Well, look, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And it's a, a genuine pleasure to uh, to join Thrings this afternoon for this uh, agricultural webinar. Uh, as you say, it's a shame we can't be doing it in person. But uh, but there we go. It does mean it does mean uh, doing this form. I think I'm on my fourth speech today. So I just hope I get the topic right. Uh, given earlier on, I was talking about antibiotics and, uh, and the veterinary <laughs> profession. Um, but look, it's, it is a pleasure to join you. It's also a pleasure to join you the day I, I, I got back from Glasgow this morning. Uh, I had a few days in, uh, in Glasgow at COP26. Minette was up there last week and we've had a team uh, covering uh, what's going on. Um, I would love to say I will give you absolute clarity of what's going to happen uh, come tomorrow night when uh, they're supposed to finish the negotiations. They're supposed to have the... Uh, the communication ready. Um, I'll tell you to start off with, I have not got a clue what is going to come out tomorrow evening. Uh, I can give you some, I can do a bit of crystal ball gazing, uh, and I can certainly tell you some of the discussions that have been going on up there. Uh, in terms of where they end, I suspect the next 24 hours is going to feel like 36 or 48 for the, uh, for the negotiators up there, but I suspect that's, that's always the case. Um, 
The most interesting thing, actually, about COP was uh, I think uh, it, it reminds it reminds all of us. It reminds the world. It reminds every sector of the economy of the importance of climate change, as it, as if we need reminding. Um, but I think for agriculture, and, and I think as the years have gone by, the uh, the input uh, in terms of agriculture and COP, and also uh, how much of COP gets dedicated to uh, agriculture and the food system has just got ever greater. Now, for some people, that is because they see agriculture as part of the problem. Uh, and for many others, including ourselves and, and all of the farmer representatives up there, it's actually because we see farming as a key component in the solution. But there's also a, a further component for me when it comes to climate change and agriculture. And that is the, the people who will be absolutely at the, 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 the forefront of being the recipients of climate change will be agriculture. We're already seeing it. We're seeing more extreme weather events. We're seeing them more often. Uh, and that will only continue. We are seeing climate change happen. And a number of uh, years ago now, uh, we had... Uh, our net zero aspiration set for British agriculture. This was 2019 at the Oxford Farming Conference. Minette Batters stood up uh, and set out the ambition for British farming to get to net zero by 2040. And at the time, uh, there, was, uh, there was great excitement around this, but there was also uh, a degree of nervousness. How on earth are we going to do it? Why are we doing it 10 years ahead of uh, UK government's target at 2050. Uh, and some people were quite challenging of it at the time. But the real reason for, for doing it, there are a number of reasons, but the first reason for doing it is it's the right thing. We need to address climate change. It is the big issue facing society and it's the right thing. The other issue, though, is that I fundamentally believe that if any sector of the economy doesn't take climate change seriously, isn't seen as part of the solution, then actually they will really struggle to, to basically have permission to carry on doing business in years to come. We're certainly seeing this in, in other sectors of the economy. Uh, and I think it's something that, that agriculture will have to uh, embrace and is embracing. This is the bit that I was so excited about in Glasgow, that actually we saw lots and lots of examples of farmers who have grabbed the opportunity, who are changing what they're doing uh, and addressing climate change. But they're not just addressing climate change because actually when you talk about resource use efficiency, when you talk about delivering uh, efficiency improvements, you're not only delivering for the planet, you're hitting that sweet spot of also delivering for your business performance at the same time. And there's this old phrase that you can't be green if you're in the red. It's a, an old one that's done the rounds of agriculture for, for many, many years. Actually, when it comes to lots of the improvements, so if I take in the cattle sector, uh, addressing animal health and welfare, or delivering genetic improvement, or delivering on feed improvement, or better using, using our nutrients in, in, uh, in arable situations, or caring for our soils, these are all things that absolutely have a green benefit, but they also have a financial benefit for our businesses. And I think that's something that's finally sort of coming home to roost. But there is still too much talk, uh, and there was too much talk in Glasgow of agriculture being the problem. Lots of discussions around methane, which is clearly a real challenge. And, and for some people, they, they, they simply equate methane to livestock, despite the fact that actually the biggest uh, emitters of methane are still the fossil fuel industries. But I think they also see methane as a different type of gas. It is. It, it's much more, it's much shorter lived in the atmosphere uh, than CO2. So, for example, methane sits in the atmosphere with a half-life of about 9 to 12 years, whereas CO2 out of an exhaust pipe sits up there for two or 300 years. And the, the, the key there is if you strip methane out of the atmosphere, you can have a much quicker impact on climate cooling. But what they, uh, they ignore and what they basically try and do is they try and load the argument on livestock to, to ease our consciences around our addictions to fossil fuels. And I think there's a real challenge there going forward. But I do think 
it's a massive opportunity. What we're doing is we're taking uh, grass, we're taking cellulose in many of the parts of the world where you guys uh, are helping our members uh, and the wider farming community. We grow fantastic grass in this country. We've got some of the best production systems in the world and actually some of the greenest and most sustainable. And there is going to be a really exciting future for that. Uh, but you can't ignore the fact there is still uh, pressure from uh, certain groups from certain sectors of the economy that will be challenging agriculture and continue to challenge agriculture. And when it comes to the climate, we need to step up. So everyone recognizes us, as I say, part of that solution. I thought I'd also not just reflect on, on COP, I'd reflect on a few other things. And I thought I'd reflect on what's been happening over the, uh, the last couple of years. Uh, you can't ignore uh, COVID. It's something we've... Uh, We've now lived with for uh, a couple of years. Uh, it's why we're meeting in this form, as, as you said, um, but it's also had some impacts. So very early on, there were some very clear impacts in terms of certain supply chains, whether that be the dairy industry, uh, particularly the horticulture industry early on, uh, the ornamental sector. But it's also had some, some slightly, uh, so maybe some, some different impacts that we weren't expecting. So the fact that, consumption shifted very quickly from out of home food service to a much greater proportion at retail has had a, a positive impact actually on prices. We know that retailers are far less promiscuous when it comes to their sourcing policies. They do generally want to buy British, whereas in the food service sector, they are uh, more promiscuous. There isn't that loyalty always to British. Uh, and actually, that's had a very positive impact on demand for, for British product, uh, British red meat, for example. Uh, and in some sectors, we are enjoying some pretty uh, healthy prices at the moment, uh, albeit accepting there are some very unhealthy prices on the input side uh, that are causing some real challenges for people. Uh, and they definitely need to be taken account of. But there were also some, some other interesting impacts of COVID. The one for me, uh, probably more than any actually, and I look at my own farm here, but I also talking to, uh, to others, was public access. We saw more people out in the countryside than ever before. One, uh, one Sunday afternoon, and, and I don't live in a particularly pretty part of the world, okay? It's a, it's a stunning part of the world as far as I'm concerned, but it's 24 miles north of Marble Arch. It doesn't have any, uh, any designation. I'm certainly not in a national park or anything else like that. But one Sunday afternoon, I had 4,000 people walk through my farm. That's predominantly because they had very little else to do. Uh, and at certain times of the last few, few months and years, um, that was the only way they could relieve their mental health. It was the only way they could get out and exercise sometimes. And I think we've actually seen a very positive legacy on that. As an industry, we faced a, a dilemma. Do we, uh, do we play to the caricature and tell everyone to get off our land and go away? Or do we actually embrace the opportunity? And, and look, there was some irresponsible behavior. You've got to face up to that. Uh, but I think in general, uh, it was nice to see people in the countryside. And what we've actually seen on the back of it is the farmer favorability studies we do, the surveys of consumers, the surveys of the public have got farmer favorability, farmer opinions higher than they have ever been in the last few years. And in fact, the, the, the main survey we do in the summer, higher than we've ever seen before. So I think actually we have got that. When you combine that with the million signatures that supported agriculture around our campaign for improvements and protection of our products in trade deals, we know that the public are, are on our side. Now, for me, the big issue for us going forward will not be around regulation. It will not be around, uh, uh, if you like, the environment we find ourselves in. It will be what the consumer wants and what the public wants. And we know, as far as farming is concerned, the public are on our side. We've just got to better articulate how they can turn that desire into an action. When they go into a supermarket, when they go into a restaurant, when they visit somewhere, they can actually articulate an action that can back British farming, not just say they want to support it. So I think there's some really exciting times. And I think uh, I want to make sure we've got time for some questions. So. 
Uh, I probably will draw the conclusion there, but I am really interested in some of the, the other bits it's got to say. I think uh, going forward, the opportunities in the carbon market, I think are potentially really exciting. I think they're also quite dangerous. I think there's a few sharks out there at the moment that I'm certainly using the, uh, the buyer beware uh, discretion with. I think when it comes to uh, planning opportunities, I think I'm really looking forward to hearing some of that. But what I do know is there's a really exciting opportunity for farming. We're absolutely amongst the best in the world. We will have some challenges. We will see change. But what we will have uh, are some of the best products produced to some of the highest standards. Uh, and that will always be in demand so long as we're delivering what the public wants. And ultimately, that's my key message, probably out of COP. Thank you, Stuart. And that's great. I mean, it's a real whistle stop tour there. And it was interesting the um, uh, the comments about COVID and how that's changed 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 customers. Um, wasn't expecting to hear about customer promiscuity on this webinar, but uh, <laughs> but thank you for that. Uh, and and and, fa and thank you in general, for, you know, to the NFU because you know we we've had a great relationship with them over the last thirty years or so. Um, and and it's been it's been great for us, and it's been it's been great great, well, great for our clients. You know, the NFU give a lot of support to our clients, um, and, you know, and we know they appreciate it, and we appreciate that. So thank you, thank you. Um, so next up is is Jonathan to talk about the um, the Agriculture Act and the uh, Environment Act as well. Thank you, Duncan. Um, hello, everyone. Um, nice to sort of see you all, I suppose, in, in a funny sort of a way. Um, what I'm going to talk about is the concepts of soil, air and water, and I'm actually going to seize upon some of the themes that Stuart mentioned about uh, being, being, uh, making sure you're not in, in the red when you want to be in the green. So you're going to sort of look at how you can be doubly green. I sort of think, think back about the last sort of 20 years of my, uh, my practice life, and I find that really interesting and important bits of law are like buses. Um, they're sort of, you, you sort of potter along doing your job for 20 years, and all of a sudden, uh, do two or three come along all at once? And two of these, the Agriculture Act 2020 and the Environment Act 2021, which very excitingly came into, into law, got the Royal Assent yesterday after some quite interesting debates in, in the House of Lords, finally, uh, whereby there was some discussion about the enforcement powers of the Office of Environmental Protection and also discharge of surge into waters, and that known as the, uh, the Wellington Amendments. And the Duke of Wellington tried to put a, a boot into the government um, didn't didn't sort of quite stick, so that's a bit of a dad joke. Sorry about that. Um, but anyway, it received royal assent, and so here we go with it. And it is a very very exciting time. Um, I'm going to mention the third act later. Now, my experience as a, an agricultural and rural business and property lawyer, the laws relating to land use, ownership, and the environment have been quite separate and quite categorised. And so there's property law, and so that thinking about land as itself mineral rights, manorial rights, sporting rights. So that's items you can buy, sell, and lease. Then there's also environmental law. So in the various acts, like the Environment Act, the Environmental Protection Act, and the subsequent acts. Uh, and there's also the, the various schemes that affect the land, of the old IAC schemes, the basic payment scheme, single farm payment scheme of old, countryside stewardship, and then also other aspects relating to land, related to trade agreements and competition law. But I'm not really going to discuss those. So then we hit Brexit, Brexit right or wrong, not to be discussed now. Um, but the result of that is the Agriculture Act 2020 and now the Environment Act 2021. So the way these have come about is rather topsy-turvy. Um, realistically, the Environment Act should have come first, the Agriculture Act second. It didn't because the government needed a structure to agriculture quickly. Uh, and so the Agriculture Act 2020 came about first. So otherwise, the Environment Act could be seen as otherwise giving directions to the Agriculture Act, uh, then enabling schemes such as the Environmental Land Management Scheme to come along. Now, just being a lawyer, I sort of can't help but look at bits of statute. And if you look at section one of the Agriculture Act, um, you can then directly link that to the environment. Um, it also talks about financial assistance to beneficiaries, including but not limited to farmers, foresters, and land managers. Now, very quickly, I'm just going to look at some of the statutes in detail very briefly because I don't want, don't want to bore you too much of that. The section 1A of the Act is about delivering environmental outcomes. So that clean air, um, thriving plants and wildlife, and a clean, plentiful water. Section 1B is about allowing financial assistance to enable public access and jobs to the countryside, farmland and woodland. And that includes arguably education. 
Section 1C allows financial assistance um, to manage land or water, and that includes restoring or enhancing cultural or natural heritage. Now, the remainder of that clause is about financial assistance to land managers to help prevent and reverse climate change, um, reap uh, or reduce environmental hazards, animal welfare, improve soil quality, loans for productivity, animal welfare, and conserving plants. Now, if you think about what I've just spoken about, um, you'd be forgiven for thinking that the um, description was for the environmental, Environment Act 2021. It's not. It's this is Agriculture Act, but it purely focuses on environmental aspects in the first section. And that's key to understanding the whole of these new concepts. Soil, air, water are like a liturgy. They're a doctrine, they're now a holy trinity. Uh, and we need to focus, focus on that. So air, soil and water have become legal structures and they're a yardstick against which all after are measured. And I know that they are critical to land management and land use, and they're also central to law as well, but now so more than ever, and they become codified. Uh, and that's going to be a key part of your planning for land management. Now, they're all unified purposes and aims under both acts. And these three building blocks, so the, of the physical environment and agriculture, but also legally. They have same concepts, soil, land, water, but they're going to have different, different perspectives to them as you deal with them legally and practically. So then link these to the Environment Act and long-term targets of the natural environment and people's enjoyment of the natural environment air quality, water, biodiversity, um, increasing efficiency and reducing waste and waste reduction. Now the concepts of soil, air and water are now conceptualized, codified in those acts. This means that they are now defined and codified. And they can be better utilized. So as Stuart mentioned, there's something that can be utilized as assets. But why codify these concepts of soil, air and water? Because as Stuart mentioned, there's a trade for them, a marketplace, um, as well as codifying them for a protection, they are assets to be used. Now this shows the importance of these, of these issues in drafting. So these are concepts that Mark and Medina and myself can have to think about when we draft documents, be it purchase or sales of lands or overage agreements or leases or anything like that. We're also gonna see, as Stuart mentioned, a natural capital markets being created. I mean, we're seeing it already as lawyers. Um, and certainly, Mark, Diane, and I already receive instructions from both landowners and developers uh, in relation to schemes relating to, for example, nitrate, mitig nit nitrate mitigation in Hampshire. Now, this relates to the mandated biodiversity net gain to ensure that all new development sites enhance the environment. Now, the uh, biodiversity net gain, or I'm going to refer to it as BNG, should be a minimum of 10%, but ideally could be higher. The key point here is that the Act is the United Kingdom's enabler to enforce prevention of further climate change and in fact reverse its effects, as Stuart mentioned. And don't forget, that's its primary purpose. Yes, it helps enable our businesses, but that's the core aim, is protecting the planet. So the ENACT enables both physical benefits for our climate and land, but also effectively financial incentivizes landowners and land managers to do so, and that's the important thing. Again, thinking back to Stuart's comments about um, making sure that you're not in the red to be green. And don't forget these points while you, while you use this codification to better your land and business. Now, there are many burgeoning businesses, and again, Stuart mentioned this, and organisations which will help you get understanding and audit of your natural capital. Uh, and you can offer what you can offer others in terms of biodiversity and that gain. Now, there are regulatory services. And they're also, don't forget your cultural services. So we're talking about tourism, recreation, education. And there's also going to be services called provisioning services. Now that's the old sort of concepts you might well think more about. So food, water, fuel, fiber, timber. So the more traditional markets. So what I'm, I'm taking forward here is we've got the old ideas of land usage, but there are now different markets and marketplaces for what land can produce. But also suggests you get heavily involved with your local nature recovery strategies, and that's come under the, uh, the Environment Act. And these are rather like local plans for development, but this is an opportunity to feature in a local authority nature planning concepts. And these are really important as they're going to be an aid and memoir for local authorities in the private sector for decades to come in terms of land use and management. 
So commercially, how can this be utilised? How does the codification of air, soil and water potentially benefit you as well as the climate? Once you've quantified your, your BNG potential, and ideally using the government biodiversity 2.0 network um, metric that was produced in, uh, in about July by Natural England, then you have a quantifiable asset. But the structure to trading and selling these carbon credits seems to be like a financial product. And I think we can probably expect some further regulation from the government as to how that is done, perhaps even involvement of the Financial Services Authority. There's going to be a lot more bodies involved in these trading than perhaps we might just think first of all. But with all these things, there's going to be need to be agreement as to how these carbon credits are paid for and utilised. There needs to be a plan. The scenario that we're often coming across at the moment is one where a developer will buy carbon credits from a landowner in order to enable an agreed biodiversity net gain. That could be planting trees, it could be creating new water courses, it could be anything that you can see from my shoulder on that picture. Now you're gonna need an ecologist as well as an agent to work out what's gonna happen, where it's gonna happen, who's gonna organize it, and crucially, and I love this phrase from the other side of my life, what does success look like? What's that vision look like and how is it gonna be enacted? What are the measurements gonna be? That's gonna be quite a tr tricky thing to do. Now, the best opportunities for both the environment and environment enhancing schemes lie in groups. Now, certainly there have been some big cooperative groups already created in order to deliver environmental effects, some down in Hampshire, one around Poole, and also in my nation of Thumberland, around the, uh, the rivers Coca and the river Tweed. Now, collaboration is key to all these things, and there's going to have to be consideration in terms of planning and delivery of these schemes over large areas of land. There's been some, again, some really amazing work already in relation to these schemes put together with a huge number of farmers. But remember that these concepts relate both to private and public funding. And the scenario I've just discussed is, is a private one. There's also obviously publicly funded schemes as well, and the environmental land management scheme that comes into place under the Act. There's going to be the farm-based sustainable farming incentive, um, local nature recovery plans, and also large scale landscape recovery schemes. That's small scale, medium scale, and big scale. There's also some concepts coming into place called conservation covenants. And these are quite separate mechanisms under the Environment Act that enable delivery of schemes at perhaps a local level. Now, the key to understanding these and realizing that they're slightly different is that they are legally binding between a landowner and a designated responsible body. So, perhaps a consult conservation charity or not for profit to conserve natural heritage features. Um, and they are going to be a contract. There's going to be a contractual basis, but they'll be anchored in the ground, excuse the pun, by local land charge. So that has effects in relation to uh, into property work. Now, the issues concerning me as a property lawyer, as well as a business lawyer, is that um, there's being a land charge, there's going to be a potential for a lot of convincing issues when you're dealing with these points. So there could be option agreements, there could be overages, there could be tenants agreements, mortgages, buying and selling land. Or they had some interesting conversations with bankers as to how they think they're going to deal with these conservation covenants, whether there's a valuation issue when it comes to mortgaging land. Uh, as Stuart's mentioned, there's an awful lot to think about when you're dealing with these new points. It's exciting, but there's challenges. So in summary, air, soil and water have previously been part of a sort of amorphous thing called land but they're now codified as unique assets in their own right to be traded, but cherished and used well, but more importantly, used to help society enable and um, reverse climate change. So whereas before we simply had land and certain concepts within that, land is now broken down into even more parts that you have to think about in your land management, but also when you're dealing with things legally. It's fascinating stuff, and I'm not gonna go on about it much longer um, because there's a lot more to talk about. Um, and third one, what's the third act I thought about that's interesting? Well, actually, it could be trade, it could be animal welfare. I think watch this space. Thank you very much. Duncan. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, it's fascinating. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's a fascinating subject and, and we're at the, we're at sort of the beginning of the, the beginning of the journey on it. Um, so it's obviously going to evolve, evolve quite a lot over the, over the coming years, but, you know, there's never been a, a, a more important um, need to have, you know, have, to, have, to have professionals, you know, who know about these things, and, you know, and we're very lucky to have you on, to have you on board. So thank you for that. Um, we now move to planning uh, and planning uh, in sort of context of diversification. So um, over, over to you, Di. 
If you could just turn your mic, sorry. First blunder is on me, so I'll take that. <laughs> Thank you for that, Duncan. Good afternoon to you all. I'm going to be speaking about how you can utilize the planning um, system in respect of diversification if you're a farmer or a landowner. Uh, the reason why I'm doing this is I grew up in a farm in West Wales. We experienced diversification firsthand. So we went from rearing primarily cattle and sheep, uh, change of use, a large scale game farm, and also a shoot. So when I work with diversification projects, large or small, I'm really mindful and empathetic to not only the family strains that can be involved, but the financial risks people are taking and the community pressures that go hand in hand with changing farming traditions and also changing land use, which is or not always uh, uh, possible in some communities. So diversification is essentially utilising your assets, skills and generating the best possible income, protecting your farm for the future generations. I think it's a really good time to diversify using the planning system. We've got a reduction of cap payments being phased out, record fertilizer prices, the country's experiencing between 10 and 12,000 shortage of butchers. So it's a knock on effect to the farming economy, especially in the pig industry. And I suggest that diversification should be at the forefront of farming and landowners' minds. I'm not so sure if it was at the forefront of leaders' minds in COP26, um, in my opinion, there was actually, Stuart's laughing, in my humble opinion, <laughs> there was actually a notable absence in farming focus in COP26, and yet land and farm use is responsible for 30% of greenhouse gases here in the UK. But before I jump into examples of diversification, I've looked to um, some research that's been done by our friends in DEFRA. It was published in March this year in relation to a time period of 2015 to 2019, so farming revenue. Love a stat. So in the southeast, we've got a reduction of farming revenue by 54%. Uh, recently speaking in AGM up there, and they think it's because they've diversified and they've diversified so well. So hold that stat in mind when you're considering your diversification projects. Then we go to Yorkshire and Humber. They've had an increase over the same period, 26%, 452 million of that 382 million in pigs. 36% of the UK pig population. So when we're then thinking about what's happening in the world with the shortages of the butchers and the pigs, it is an opportunity to stabilise your money and to utilise the assets you've got. So how do I suggest you diversify? Well, firstly, keep it simple. You don't need to reinvent the wheel always. Um, when looking at the environment act, it is going to change how you make, make some considerations. Specifically, we've got part six, section 92 and schedule 14. I won't read you the statute, but you're more than welcome to ask me for a link and I'll send it to you. Now, those statute bits, they make provisions for biodiversity net gain, the BNG Jonathan was referring to, and it's to be skewed as a, pre a precondition. So a condition that's applied to your planning, but pre the commencement. And then tying in that, we're going to have a new section 90A of the TCPA, the Town and Country Planning Act. And that's mirroring up the Environment Act, requiring all planning permission is subject to a condition to ensure the biodiversity value is attributable to the development. It has to exceed the pre-development value by at least the 10% that Jonathan was referring to. And that's the BGD, so the Biodiversity Gain Objective. And it's used uh, measured using the DEFRA metric that's very accessible. I'll touch on that later. But in practice, what we're going to see is pre-commencement planning commission. That's how you'll feel when you're putting in your apps. That's going to require the biodiversity net gain plan that has to be submitted to and approved by your LPA. So it's a time to start picking up the phone and getting on with your officers. And that's going to evidence how your gains are going to be obtained, but also how they'll be monitored and maintained on an ongoing basis for the next 30 years. It's a long-term investment. Those registers are going to be recorded under part six, sections 91, one to nine inclusive. And then we're looking at what policy is also attributing to that. And we've got the NPPF, Paras 174D, 179B, and 180D, and they go to the heart of what the Environment Act's doing. So possibly we'll have another revision of the NPPF in the near future, 
who knows? But from my understanding of the statute, and let's be honest, it was only rubber stamped yesterday, I can't see any exceptions to development for the 10% BNG, so I don't think any of our clients would get out of it. However, the caveat there is PD rights, they're not a concern. Why do I light up with that? Well, it's our good old class Q and our class R's. They're still great for diversification. They're still valuable opportunities to use planning to get a bit of extra cash. So we've got your barn conversions into residential or your conversions into commercial, and you can look at doing it in a fallback position or salami slicing up in the meters. Bit of a tactic going on there. In addition to your class Q and class R, I think the other thing we're seeing a lot of recently, Jonathan touched upon it, and I'm sure Mark will as well, is the change of use to land for the offsetting of carbon following the EA, but also for phosphates and nitrates that seem to hold a lot of planning back at the moment, and quite rightly so when it's considering the knock-on effect of the environment. I suggest that there's currently a gold rush um, to offer up land by landowners and farmers to mitigate the land use and to utilize a change of use. But I've got a first warning here. I anticipate some tensions in the future between farming trying to offset their own um, carbon versus the offsetting of town and country planning development or DCO development. So what are you going to use more? Utilize your carbon or sell your land via a contract um, and utilize the TCPA development. So we're looking at award-winning changing farming practice via diversification for your own use or the selling of credits. I think there's going to be a lot of policy and a lot of chat coming up in the next few months and years about that. Um, applying that to an example of a life case we've just been working on. So recently acted for a developer building a new hotel, no opportunity for on-site mitigation um, in respect of nitrates and there was no opportunity either to submit a contribution, so I have financial means. So we're currently looking at heads of terms for planting trees in another site with a landowner. That is going really smooth. But the key point here is what the Environment Act's training, they're changing. So in that instance, it's the mitigation of nitrates only because it's pre the EA. So we had the room to negotiate the triggers. The LP at the first instance wanted the trigger to be um, nitrates mitigated at the commencement of development, and the developer wanted it to be when everything was concluded. We successfully able to get what our client wanted, so it's a commercially viable problem. But the key distinguishing feature is if you read the Schedule 14 of the new Act, there's no flexibility. Those conditions, those pre-commencement conditions, are that their pre-commencement, as I understand it. So you're not going to be able to develop a, a much uh, room when you're negotiating for those conditions. So in addition to the QR and the land management, um, I'm going to look at camping. Why camping? Well, again, another stat out of 2,000 full-time campsites in the UK, 212,000 farms are here. So what are we doing? And Stuart, for you with your 4,000 people walking across the farm, there's room for a bit of cash, and let's be honest, cash is king always, eh? But in the, in the last year, 9.6 million campers have paid to stay in places around the UK. So this is a great opportunity for us. But again, diversification, it has to be, do you have the assets and do you have the skills? And in this instance, do my research, there are so many companies willing to take on farming practices and act as your agents so you can have the land and people can manage the campsites. Now, you can either do it as a PDR, so you've got your 28 days. This year has been boosted to 58 by uh, Boris Johnson and his friends, so a distance-assisted uh, economy. Or you can go for your full planning permission, which will now attach the 10% of the BNG, so biodiversity net gain. But in addition to your biodiversity net gain, depending on the area you live, you're also going to have your nitrate or your phosphate and any of the other conditions attached. So another example to give using a live case, because I think it's easier to paint a picture when I think of things. We had a series of campsites in an area in an AOMB, and a lot of campsites had received an enforcement notice due to changes of nitrates and how the LPA's policy was written. 
So the client contacted us, was very keen to be able to not receive an enforcement notice and to open as usual. Fantastic client. She contacted, she contacted an ecologist, worked with the ecologist, got some numbers, contacted the LPA at the first instance, and with the aid of the all the work the ecologist had did, drafted a UU, so it's a legal undertaking, had an either or clause, put it forward to the LPA, they were satisfied. A lot of sweet talking, but a lot of help from the ecologists, real collaboration, and campsite opened as planned. So what do we learn there? You're front loading, you're spending the money earlier on to save time and to save cost. I'm um, Cardi Yorkshire and Scottish. I don't like putting my hand in my pocket, but sometimes you've got to pay for what you get. And front loading and planning, I think, uh, screams just winning um, opportunities. So in, in planning again, I've got two recent appeals. They're both camping related. They're both August and they're both written reps. So if any of you do have campsites, be mindful of this. So in Cottonmere's Country Park in East Sussex, they wanted to extend an additional 50 caravans. There was significant adverse impact on the landscape and significant adverse impact to the visual scheme. But what these people had done, it was genius. They'd front loaded with a lot of experts, really good quality information, and they had evidenced 1.5 million additional income into the local economy by those people utilizing the food, the restaurants, the shops, everything under the sun. And the judgment went in favor of the campsite and the caravan park, and it was successfully extended. And then another one, if you do have a caravan park, get out your old planning permission, in the South Holland case, again, August 2021, there was an old planning permission that didn't restrict the additional amount of numbers should someone be minded to go for more in the future. So what the judge looked at was the condition, the intricacy and in the drafting, and he said, fine, up the numbers, there's no material change of land. So it's a lesson, have a look, front load and get the right advice earlier or on um, to successful both for things. But my final diversification is something that's coming out of COP26. So um, this is something that's really caught my eye. I think it's one for the future. Um, I'm quite excited about what projects could come out of here and the innovation as well. It's all about methane. So the UK and the global leaders in COP26 have pledged um, targets for methane. And I suggest that as I'm mirroring what Stuart said again, but Farming isn't just the problem. I think we're a huge amount of um, success, innovative. We're really dynamic in farming. And I think we're a huge part of the solution, especially when we're considering the circular economy. So what are we looking at in the future? Well, for those of you that don't know, methane is already running tractors. It's already heating certain parlors and doing things. It's, it's wonderful what can happen. What I'd really love if any of you have got a project like this out there is something where we're looking at using the methane from a large cattle herd, large dairy, and we're doing a change of use, huge planning applications, the large glass houses that could be heated all year round to grow fruit and veg, or flowers and take us over the 60% productivity of what we currently have in the UK. Now to conclude, I think we're going to see a flurry of policies, gov back schemed, uh, government back schemes, sorry, following the success of COP26, the methane page and the Environmental Act. Again, there's no real impact on the GPDO, so plough on with your class Qs, your class Rs, usual challenges there to is it a conversion is it a rebuild use the hibbit and use it well and then whilst i don't know if the app goes far enough to measure the actual wildlife use and the relevant habitats have to take a step back always and you think what are we trying to do and why and what were the people drafting that app trying to do and why they were trying to give us a tool that is easy to use, and I suggest Section 92 and Section 14 of the Act are that. They're a tool that's easy to use, it's clear on the face of it, and I think it'd be clear to use in practice. Again, the LPAs are going to be faced with a need to regulate development and mitigation at the heart. And again, we're looking at schemed conditions, but this time the commencement of development to take, uh, not to take place unless the scheme has been submitted and rubber stamped by the increasingly stretched LPAs. Really feel for them with all the extra work. 
There's going to be a continued presence in camps, and again, the same for lamps. And as always, this is a key bit, the integrity of the condition will turn on the precision of the drafting. And thinking back to that caravan case, it couldn't be better said. There's a warning shot here, though. If your LPA believes that the effect of your drafting of your condition is not being met by you adequately, you will be vulnerable to an enforcement notice, a breach of condition notice, and the alleged, alleged breach, as always, will be demonstrated by criminal burden of proof. So very serious stuff, and you're going to need to pick up the phone pretty quick. Essentially, when you are putting in an application and you are gathering your team, try and use the ratio of two ears to one mouth, a bit more listening, listen to your experts, front load your application, engage in the right team for you, the right experts at the earliest possible point, and always have a fallback position or salami, supplies, salami slice the planning when and where the need rises. In all honesty, listening to COP26, following the VA and everything, I personally have a hopeful um, view on the future of farming and the role planning can play for diversification and income generation. I think farmers in history and farming in general, it's full of people who work hard, they sometimes fail, but generally they overcome many boundaries such as natural ones, policy, legal constraints. But I think we've got a we've got a good future ahead of us if we just think well, collaborate, and use the right team. But thank you very much. Thank you, Di. Uh, well, it was always going to be trouble to uh, and to limit a lawyer to ten minutes, but uh, but there's a fact. It's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. So thank you for that. Um, so it just leads on to on, on to Mark Charter. Um, Mark always seems to be the last speaker in our talks, and he always has. He, he never quite knows. How long he has to talk for because it depends on how long everyone else has spoken for. So um, I, I, I'm not sure how long I've got now, Duncan. <laughs> I believe it's a good judgment, but if you could be as quick as possible, and then we can get to a few questions right. because a few questions we'll have popped up. So thank you. Okay, Th thanks, Duncan, very much. And um, uh, I, I would say um, Stuart's uh, one one of his sort of last um, parting shots in his talk about fire aware very much applies to my segment of uh, this afternoon. I just want to give a few observations and I'll do a real canter through of what I've been seeing in development agreements um, in the context that um, uh, both Joe and I have been sort of painting of natural capital. And natural capital I'll use as a shorthand to extend to nitrate mitigation, carbon offset, biodiversity, habitat translocation, water neutrality, everything you can think of. And I'm going to talk really principally in the context of residential development and um, renewables and specifically solar. But the principles of what I'm going to say would apply to really any um, situation where a landowner sells land or indeed lets it be under an FPT or whatever. But I think the sort of the one um, sort of take home point I'd like to sort of emphasize and um, comes very much back to the sort of buyer beware type principle Stuart mentioned is that don't um, give away all the future potential in your land for natural capital because this is very much an emerging market. Um, a lot of aspects of natural capital um, can't, there is no universally accepted system to measure it or identify it. And so actually ascertaining the future pool of natural capital that may um, lie in your land could be impossible at the moment. And so I think um, we need to be very careful when advising our clients that they only give away such natural capital as is needed to sustain a very specific project. Um, in the development land world specifically, um, and I'm talking really about cases where landowners are um, offering fairly large tracts of land to um, developers, where that tract of land can um, actually supply both the development land and also the natural capital land. Um, I think, think very carefully how you um, structure that. And I have had a case very recently, just exchanged um, an option agreement on it, where um, probably unusually, the developer had very early on in its master plan identified uh, where the natural capital land would sit. And in fact, did agree with us that they would accept a restrictive covenant that that land would only be used for natural capital purposes. And the reason I say that is that um, things will change over time. And um, it may well be that that natural capital land actually ends up getting used for something else. Um, and if it does have um, potential for development in the future, 
um, having imposed a, a covenant relating to natural capital on it, um, and it, it does end up having another purpose in the future, it does force the developer or the developer's successor to come and talk to the landowner about paying some added value. Um, I also um, think that in pricing mechanisms in development agreements, again in the context I'm speaking about where you, you're offering a large tract of land which might offer both the residential um, the development land for example and also the associated natural capital land, um, be very careful about the pricing mechanisms which can be labyrinthine in these agreements and don't undersell your natural capital land and I know um, many of you who are watching this afternoon who are land agents will be totally on point as it were on that I'm sure. Where your land is actually providing the natural capital to um, underwrite, as it were, development of someone else's land. I think there's some very specific points um, that the landowner needs to look at. And those are really, to reiterate what I just said, that only give away the natural capital that will support a specific project. In other words, it can be described as um, giving away the natural capital to support so many houses consented under a specific planning permission. Um, and um, if the, um, as very often is the case with the potential schemes, that someone else will need to come onto your land, be a developer, the planning authority, whoever, to police and monitor and manage your land to see whether the natural capital requirements are being met. Um, be very careful to have policing mechanisms in the agreement for that, so that you can, as the landowner, have a say in when and where people come onto your land, how they access it, and need it enable you to actually vary routes of access and so forth in the future so you don't actually totally sterilize your land and your use of it um, for, the, for the long term and of course it goes about saying as lawyers we'd always expect um, anyone developer um, particularly to indemnify you as the landowner in relation to any loss or damage they cause in that process. Um, I think landowners um, are increasingly discussing reserving natural capital benefit um, uh, in the context of uh, options for solar leases. And this, is, I think, is a much more tricky proposition. And there are a number of sort of practical and technical difficulties um, in capturing this from a landowner's perspective, because um, at the moment, I mean, as really all speakers have alluded to, and, and you know, Stuart and his very sort of um, setting the scene for us, um, natural capital and what it means will develop over many years. A lot of these leases for solar parks are 30, 40 year leases with rights to renew. And so in that 30, 40, 50 years or whatever it may be, um, I'm sure natural capital uh, will evolve. And what we've identified as natural capital constituents at the moment um, will um, change over time. And I'm sure we will add probably greatly to the list. So consequently, um, from a landowner's perspective, I want to define natural capital in the widest possible terms. I also want to reserve the easements to exploit the um, natural capital in the widest possible terms, both in terms of the, the right to, to practically manage and exploit it, but also to sell its benefits and its credits. And this, I think, gives people like solar tenants a big problem because I'm basically asking them to accept very wide ranging terms which no one really will know, possibly for some time in the future, what the exact effect will be. So I think there's some um, interesting conversations to be had in that context. And I think naturally people like solar operators, operators will be saying, well, if I submit to these types of terms, then they must always be qualified by me not having to, me the solar operator, not having to um, accede to anything that actually um, disrupts my commercial operation of the site. So really what I'm saying is that natural capital and negotiations around it are inevitably going to be a balancing act between landowners and those looking to benefit from the um, natural capital to facilitate development elsewhere. And I think the um, last thing I'll say is natural capital issues are embryonic and the legal structures for them are embryonic. It is, we don't yet have established patterns of documentation so it is a market that's got to, to um, mature. And I couldn't really um, end on any better um, words than Stuart's um, words, which still ring in my mind, which is, is buyer beware. So that is my um, mantra. And I think, um, you know, please do come and talk to us if you're thinking about these things, because the devil is in the detail. So Duncan, I'm sorry for a canter through, but I hope that might help with timing. No, that, that's perfect. The consummate professional as ever, Mark. 
so so thank you for that. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, we're pretty much we're almost at five, but but we have got a bit of time for uh, a couple of questions, or at least at least one question. I'll, I'll, I'll just fire a quick one to to die, uh, which is when does the BNG ten percent requirement take effect? So if you answer that quickly, Di, please. I do apologise, haven't been on Zoom for a while. The Act, the act is in force now, so it's depending on where you are with your planning application um, will depend on when you get caught. But the Act's there now, and the condition means that your trigger will be prior to the commencement of development. So if you want to pop me an email and give me a few extra details, um, I'd be more than, <laughs> more than happy to listen more and uh, get back to you on that one. Okay, thank you. And then, and then a, a non-legal one, which I'll, I'll direct to Stuart, which was about um, uh, methane production and animal diets. If you could give us a quick few, few words on that. Yeah, it's, a, it's a great question. And I think it's an area where there is a huge potential. There's quite a lot of research going on. And, and definitely there will be uh, certain feed additives that are very useful in reducing methane uh, and a number of other aspects. I think there'll be ultimately going forward, there'll be genetic improvements as well. But it's, it's quite an exciting area. And just to just to put it in context, we're we're already ahead of the game here in the UK in terms of our production. So, for example, there are 276 million dairy animals on the planet producing milk. If they were all as efficient as a UK dairy cow today, you'd only need 73 million to get the same level of production. Uh, and things like additives, things like uh, other technologies can only help us not only stay ahead of the game, but get ever more efficient in our production. Uh, and that's something we should all be rightly proud of. Thank you, Stuart. Well, I, I can't think of a better way to end than on that stat about the efficiency of, of, of British cows. So, uh, you know, I'm, uh, there, is, there, there is actually another planning question, but it's quite a long one. So I'll, I'll leave I'll leave Di to uh, um, to answer that in her own in her own time. But just uh, obviously, you know, it's, it's nearly five o'clock. So um, I just want to wrap up really and say thank you to our speakers, especially to Stuart. Who, you know, he's obviously had a, I mean, he's got a hectic schedule normally, but it must be doubly so uh, having just got back from COP. So thank you very much for, for taking the time. Obviously, thank you to the other speakers. But but thank you, um, you know, the attendees. You know, you know, we wouldn't do this uh, without you. Um, you know, we really value you taking the time. Uh, obviously spread spread the word about this because as i said you can see it on the youtube channel it will be available later we'll issue an e-shot uh, to all the people who registered with various links um, and information about the firm uh, and obviously if you've got further queries you know come back to any of us um you know and, and we'll make sure we direct you in the right uh, you know in, in the right direction so so thank you again and and hopefully we'll see you in person next year in Siren System, but obviously we want to see you before then and, and speak to you and find out what you're doing and what, what you're up to. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.